Okay, this week we're going to finish uh, chapter one, talking about chapter one. Uh, we were talking about the biopsychosocial framework before, and now we're going to talk about we're going to talk about the developmental theories that have come out of uh, out of psychology. Uh, Darwin wasn't really a psychologist, but he had the first uh, theory that ex tried to explain human development. Um, it was fairly obvious that uh, humans didn't always look like this, like modern humans, uh, that we look like something else, and that other animals had changed over time, as had humans. Darwin looked at biological processes and attempted to explain how humans adapted to their environment. And the truth is that uh, people that live in the in the desert, like uh, like the Diné people, uh, you you don't uh, handle things or do things or, or um, uh, have ways of of of, uh, of finding food uh, that other uh, indigenous people have. Uh, the desert is completely different from the northern plains, for example, or the or the uh, the forests of uh, east of the Mississippi River. Uh, so the indigenous people, the indigenous peoples of the Americas, uh, of course, uh, the farther north they live, the uh, the longer the uh, uh, the cold period that they had to survive in, uh, the more food that they had to accumulate for for winter. Uh, so people adapt to their environment uh, to the extent that. Uh, the um, Alaska Native and, and indigenous population, the indigenous populations that lived uh, in Alaska or northern Canada, of course, uh, who lived uh, near the ocean, uh, their way of survival was very, very much different than, than it was uh, in the, the deserts of the Southwest. Uh, so this, he saw this and, and he understood that, uh, that people adapt to the environment that they happen to be living in. Darwin felt that all creatures, including humans, must maintain a fitness for, for the environment they live in or adapt to fit the environment. Adaptation merely means change. It doesn't imply uh, progress or improvement. Just because you're able to survive in the desert uh, doesn't mean that, uh, that you, uh, can, uh, you can't uh, survive in a uh, cold, colder climate. Um, there are lots and lots of different examples. People that live in rural environments, of course, uh, might have a difficult time surviving in, a, um, in an urban environment. Uh, people in an urban environment complain about, uh, about rural uh, uh, environments all the time. If they have to go live in them, they don't, they don't like the, the uh, lack of noise. They don't like the insects. They don't like, uh, you know, Lots of different things, and of course, uh, uh, being a uh, farm boy from uh, from Indiana, I really don't like living in urban environments. Uh, my wife and I lived in uh, uh, Northridge, California, which is um, is one of the suburbs, uh, kind of. It's about eighty or ninety miles away from from Los Angeles, but it's one of the uh, the suburbs of Los Angeles, and. Uh, uh, we didn't realize it at the time, but um, uh, we were sleep deprived while we were there because there was so much noise. We didn't really think about it uh, while we were there. We didn't realize it until afterwards that we were probably sleep deprived because we we lived on a, on a, a a fairly busy uh, roadway that was that was busy all night long, uh, and we weren't you really used to living in that kind of an environment. We were both uh, Air Force personnel, had been Air Force personnel before. My wife was still Air Force personnel at the time. And we had lived on Air Force bases, but uh, the noise of, of jet airplanes is very much different than cars constantly going by uh, at night. And, and that kind of kept us awake. So we were somewhat sleep deprived. Psychologists today have adapted uh, Darwin's theories into a field known as evolutionary psychology or sociobiology. They see genetics as the prime driving force in social behavior. Uh, they do not discount the interaction between heredity and the environment.
Uh, and this, of course, is uh, ch the change of brain size. Uh, why didn't the early hominids uh, uh, require a, a larger brain? And the answer is uh, has something to do with uh, a different body shape, uh, a different uh, dietary uh, necessity. Uh, one of the things that we do know about Homo sapiens, um, Homo sapiens actually don't have the largest brain, uh, ho uh, hominid brain. The uh, largest hominid brain belonged to the Neanderthal, uh, who was about 400 cc's larger than the, uh, than the modern human. Uh, so why, why did we need a larger brain? We needed a larger brain to figure out where to get food um, and, and figure out how to, uh, how to prepare that food. Once we started cooking food, it, uh, it, changed, it changed things. When you, when you eat raw meat, uh, you have to be able to, to break down uh, the meat in its, in its raw form. Uh, but if you cook it, it uh, breaks down the protein. Uh, but if you cook it, uh, the pro it, the cooking actually breaks the protein down so that you can digest it easier. Uh, so that's one of the things that has happened. Um, the, uh, the early hominids had to eat a lot. Uh, they had to eat uh, fairly constantly, just like chimpanzees and, and uh, the great apes uh, have, to, uh, have to eat uh, fairly constantly. But as humans, of course, uh, we don't. Uh, we eat whatever we eat. Uh, and we cook a lot of our foods. And of course, other animals don't do that. Other hominids have not, been, have not done that. Uh, so there's a lot of changes, a lot of things that we needed to do. And that's one of the reasons why we needed the bigger brain, to figure these things out. The ultimate goal of all individual behavior and developmental change is survival of the genetic material. All organisms adapt their behavior to ensure the survival of the basic elements of life. Sociobiologists look at different aspects of social behavior to determine if it is adaptive. Altruism, for example, helping people that aren't in your genetic structure. Uh, competition. Is competition good for, uh, is, is it good for uh, the species? Socialization, why are we the most socialized animals in the world? Does socialization help? Uh, mating behavior, um, how, how does that uh, tie into uh, to our survival? And of course, communication. Uh, all, just about all animals communicate in one way or another. Uh, humans seem to be the, the, the ones who communicate the most. And of course, our mating behavior is, is uh, ritualized. Um, uh, socialization is fairly ritualized. Uh, this all has to do with, if you think of, uh, of the uh, traditions of the Diné people, uh, all of these things are part of, uh, of your traditions. Altruism, competition, socialization, mating behavior, and communication. All of these are ritualized within your traditions. And of course that is the reason that we have we have different cultures. Each culture gives us the a, a template as to how to function uh, in our culture and all of these things are part of it. Ethology is the study of how innate behavior and hereditary factors influence developmental changes. One example would be Noam Chomsky's uh, language acquisition device, also known as the LAD. It's a genetic predisposition to learn language to facilitate social interaction. And we know this because uh, we have uh, seen individuals who uh, were not given a language, were not given uh, language skills, uh, they were isolated, so they had no uh, human uh, interaction, no language skills, uh, and these individuals um, had a very difficult time uh, later in life, uh, even though they were brought into, into a culture later uh, that had spoken language, uh, they never developed language skills, as curious as all that is. So the language acquisition device seems to be something real. This is, this is actually Noam Chomsky right here. 
Uh, and of course, communication is extremely important to the point that uh, social media seems to have taken over a great deal of people's uh, attitudes in today's society. Another example of ethology would be Conrad Lorenz's uh, work showing that inducing the mothering instinct in a species leads to survivability in the offspring. It's really kind of curious. Um, I was uh, working in Montana, and a lot of the people in Montana are cattle ranchers. And uh, one of my students had developed a... Uh, had developed a breed of cattle that uh, where the, the mothers were uh, had a strong mothering instinct the heifers had stronger mothering instincts and uh, in the beginning nobody really cared because these weren't larger cattle uh, they were a form of Angus uh, I'm, I don't think it was a black Angus and I don't think it was a red Angus it was it was some mixture of, of, uh, of breeds and he had developed this uh, this breed with a uh, a strong mothering instinct, and uh, of course, since they were smaller cattle, not as large, you know, fifty or or a hundred pounds means a whole lot when you're selling your meat. Uh, so uh, eventually, of course, when it, when it got out that that uh, okay, so you've got. Um, one breed that uh, doesn't mother very well, but it's, they're large, and another breed that's a little bit smaller, uh, but they have a stronger mothering uh, instinct. What happens is that more calves will survive uh, in in this uh, in the smaller breed because the mothers are much better at taking care of their of their of their calves, uh, and so eventually, of course, after two or three years, when people realized what was going on. And when they, when they did the math, what they discovered was by using the smaller cattle with the better mothering instinct, uh, they were able to produce more beef uh, by pound, of course, than with the larger breeds of cattle. And so uh, he started selling his cattle, and he did very, very well. And now he uh, is buying up ranches in, in, uh, in Montana. Uh, because of his uh, of his cattle, uh, it's really kind of interesting all, as well. Because while he was doing this and not selling his cattle because they were they weren't as large as the other cattle, uh, he was maintaining his uh, his ranch by raising sheep and selling and selling the wool. So he was uh, he was actually uh, his money maker was his sheep and his cattle were his uh, almost his hobby. Uh, but now, of course, it's it's flip flopped, and I don't I don't know if he raises sheep anymore. Uh, he was still raising sheep when I left in uh, 2010. Uh, an example of Lorenz's work is uh, research that has found that when women are shown pictures of a baby, they have greater uh, pupillary dilation than men do. Uh, Eckerd Hess in 1962 concluded that women may have a greater biological predisposition to respond to babies. And of course, that is that would prove Lorenz's theory. Um, other developmental theories, the psychodynamic theory, the, the first developmental theory uh, was the psychodynamic theory. Uh, the psychodynamic theory uh, theories uh, view the uh, individual as solitary against the rest of the world. Uh, this, the first psychodynamic theory was Freud's psychosexual theory that purported that man developed due to sexual drives, a psychosexual developmental theory. And of course, if you go on in psychology, one of the things you're going to discover, uh, we're going to talk, especially if, if you take a, take a class from me, you'll, you'll find out uh, about uh, Freud's psychosexual developmental theory. Uh, it became very important because it uh, was the basis of all developmental theories of that time. Uh, and uh, he was writing in the uh, end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century. Uh, so it became the, the uh, cornerstone for uh, developmental theories. But of course it wasn't the last one. And, and all, all theories that came after Freud actually were developed to argue with Freud. Um, we had a, a very sexually repressed society uh, back at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. Uh, and so talking about sex made people nervous. 
and it made scientists nervous too because they were they were ascribing sexual feelings for children for infants and the people didn't like this they 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 thought that they needed something they needed something that fit better with uh with the culture and the society of the times uh so they start they tried to refute uh, uh, Freud's theories. <clears throat> the next theory that came along was Erickson's. Uh, he refuted Freud. And actually, it's really kind of interesting because Erickson worked with Freud, uh, worked with, actually worked with uh, Freud's daughter. Erickson was a child psychologist. Uh, the interest, there are lots of interesting things <laughs> about Eric Erickson. <laughs> like that his, his name wasn't really Eric Erickson, that his name was Eric, uh, that was his first name, but his last name was uh, was not Erickson. Uh, he changed his name when he came to the United States. Uh, he was born actually born in Germany. Uh, when I was stationed in Germany uh, back in, uh, from 79 through 80, 82, uh, we lived in uh, the southwestern portion of Germany in the Rhineland Pfalz, and that's where Erickson was actually born. Uh, Erickson was Jewish, and uh, so was Freud, but that, that's not really what, what we're talking about. We're not talking about their religion. But Erickson was Jewish, and uh, he grew up in a, in a non-Jewish uh, community. And because of this, uh, he had a lot of uh, social interactions that were not positive. And that's where he came up with his theory, his uh, psychos social theory uh, of developmental uh, of developmental his developmental theory um, he uh, he he because of, of his upbringing uh, Erickson had a lot of trouble um, he was Jewish uh, most of the people around him weren't uh, there was a Jewish community that he a small Jewish community that he lived in uh, but he had a problem, and Erickson's problem was that he didn't look Jewish. He looked, he looked uh, German, and uh, so he was rejected by. He was not only rejected by the uh, the Germans because he was Jewish, but he was also rejected by the Jewish people because he looked German. Uh, so this meant there was a lot of isolation. And so what he did as he was growing up, he recognized different problems that he had. And from these problems that he had because of his isolation, uh, he came up with uh, the, the stages of development. And the first stage of development um, is a, it, you, you go, have to go through these crises. And once you go through these crises and you resolve them, then you can go on to the next stage. Uh, so the first crisis that he talks about is when you're a, a a neonate, when you're a, a brand new child, and when you're an infant, uh, you go through a time when you either trust your caregiver or you can't trust your caregiver because they're not there when you need them. And this was the first stage of his psychosexual, uh, psycho, uh, uh, <laughs> of the, uh, wait a minute, yeah, his, his first stage was uh, trust versus mistrust. That's Erickson. Uh, According to Freud, his first stage was the oral stage because uh, your focus is on uh, is on get, gaining sustenance, uh, and of course breastfeeding at that time is what uh, people were doing. Uh, so according to Freud, um, the first stage was the oral stage, everything focused on the mouth, and as far as uh, Erickson was current, concerned, the the social crisis that you had to go through in the psychosocial theory was trust versus mistrust. And this had to be resolved at birth. Either you trusted your caregiver or you didn't trust your caregiver to give you what you needed. And of course, the oral stage had to be, uh, you focused on, uh, on your needs. And at that time, the only need you had was sustenance. Uh, the second stage of the psychosexual theory is the anal stage between years one and three when the child focuses on potty training to become a responsible member of society. The second crisis in the psychosocial theory is autonomy versus shame and doubt when the child must learn to become an independent person. How do you do that? You become independent by figuring out how to go to the bathroom by yourself. So they're both, they're both focusing on the same thing. But Freud is focusing on the sexual aspect of it, 
and uh, Erickson is focusing on the uh, on the social aspect of the same uh, the same crisis, and the crisis is needing to learn uh, to uh, d needing to become potty trained. Uh, so uh, the the two theories are running parallel at this point. Uh, the third stage of the psychosexual developmental theory is the phallic stage between ages three and six, when the child realizes that they're either a boy or a girl. Biologically, they're a boy or they're, they are a girl. And they probably understand that boys have different uh, uh, genitalia than, than uh, females do. Uh, the boy, well, they, they recognize their own genitalia as different from the other, the other person. The third crisis in the psychosocial theory is initiative versus guilt when the child learns to try new things or they don't. And if they don't, of course, they don't uh, uh, resolve the crisis. Uh, but as far as little boys and little girls are concerned, um, they uh, determine uh, what their biological structure is. The fourth stage of Freud's psychosexual theory deals with the time of sexual complacency from age six uh, until puberty, and he called this the latency stage. The next crisis in Erickson's psychosocial theory is industry versus inferior inferiority in the same age range when the child learns to compete. They learn to compete by going to school, and in school they're either the, the best uh, speller or the, the fifth best speller, they're the, the, the 12th best at math, uh, they're the fastest runner or they're the slowest runner. As you can see, they're, they're constantly competing and they're learning where they come uh, in this, uh, this list of, of, uh, of uh, social needs, of education and needs. So in, as far as uh, Freud was concerned, nothing's going on at this stage. Uh, and if you've ever uh, uh, worked with uh, junior high students uh, before they start to go through puberty, uh, it's like they're really kind of cool kids because nothing's going on. Uh, you don't have to worry about uh, anything happening, and then all of a sudden their hormones start fl flowing, and uh, all bets are off. Suddenly all bets are off. They're very difficult to deal with uh, when they start going through puberty. Uh, but as far as Erickson was concerned, this is a time when they learn to compete. Freud's last stage is a genital stage when the individual emerges as a reproductive being. Erickson's adolescent crisis is identity versus identity confusion when teenagers try to discover a comfortable persona for the rest of their lives. This is not always the easiest thing in the world, uh, trying to decide whether you're going to be goth or emo or, or a jock or, uh, or a brainiac or whatever. People have to decide where they where they fit in into society, uh, whether you know how whether they're they're going to be one thing or the other. And a lot of times they just put it off, put off uh, making a decision. And this is identity confusion when they they aren't exactly sure who they are. But as far as Freud was concerned, they're finished. They're they are reproductive beings now. Uh, and they can reproduce or not reproduce as they feel f see fit. Uh, but as far as he was concerned, they are done because they now uh, are, are mature sexual beings. But the psychosocial theory continues throughout the rest of the individual's life. Erickson's next crisis faces the question of marriage or bachelorhood, intimacy versus isolation. And, uh, well, you probably haven't studied uh, English uh, society in the in the 19th and 20th century. Um, there's a uh, <laughs> there's an interesting television show uh, on uh, uh, PBS uh, on Sundays here anyway. I guess you guys don't get the same PBS that we do, but uh, it's a around the world in 80 days. It's really kind of interesting because. Um, when the the the, the show starts, uh, they're in an all male. Uh, club and these are very very common uh, bachelor being a bachelor in in uh, 19th century England was very very common uh, and they would have these clubs where only men for men only that kind of thing and of course 
Uh, most of the men uh, were either uh, bachelors or they were hiding from their wives. Uh, so the isolation thing was, was fairly common. But this is, this is a, a picture of a, or theoretically, it's a picture of a English men's club. Everybody looking the same. They've all got their medals on. They're all wearing uniforms. They've all got these goofy shoes on, and they've done their hair in an interesting style. Anyway, okay. So uh, isolation isn't isn't uh, you know bachelorhood uh, was very very common, uh, and that's what the television show is about. Phineas Phineas Fogg, uh, the, the man going around the world, uh, is a bachelor, and. Uh, He's a confirmed bachelor, and that's really what the, the show's about. The middle adulthood crisis that Erickson feels that people go through is generativity versus stagnation. Uh, during this crisis, the individual has to decide whether to help and mentor the younger generation or maintain a selfish lifestyle. Uh, of course, when we talk about the younger generation, we're not especially talking about children in school. We may be talking about uh, somebody that is 10 or 15 years younger than you and is coming up in your company. Will you mentor them or not? Uh, and, um, well, anyway, that's, that's something. Erickson's crisis uh, continues right to the end of life. Uh, the last crisis an individual faces is integrity versus despair. Does one see one's life as satisfactory or as a failure? And, of course, most people that have children uh, feel that their their life was satisfactory. Uh, people that don't have children and spent their lives making money, you know, accumulating cash, uh, a lot of times uh, they see their life as a failure because maybe they missed the, missed the boat somewhere. Anyway, a learning theory. Uh, okay, so that's uh, Erickson's developmental theory. We saw the psychosocial theory and the psycho uh, uh, psychosocial theory. Um, now we're going to look at uh, different ideas. Uh, the learning theory uh, is uh, considered a theory that is, uh, is part of development because it explains how people gain knowledge and experience. Uh, B.F. Skinner and John B. Watson suggested that they could change a child's behavior through conditioning. And so the idea was, uh, this was in the United States, of course, and uh, we, are, we worry about productivity. Uh, and so what we were, we were thinking, uh, or what was happening in the United States at this time, uh, of course, Erickson was, uh, was German and he came to the United States and developed his theory. Uh, Freud was, uh, was, uh, Austrian and, uh, he lived in Austria all of his life. And at the end he was Jewish and uh, during World War II or just before World War II started, he immigrated to England, so he, he his life ended in, uh, in England. Uh, but in the United States, of course, we were worried about productivity. We're not worried about psychosexual or psychosocial. Uh, what we're worried in is, is um, uh, helping people uh, produce as many things as they possibly can so that we can make money. And that's where the uh, learning theory comes from, the idea that you can condition people to do the work that you want them to do. That's known as the, the learning theory. This is B.F. Skinner. This is John B. Watson. Uh, they weren't really worried about anything except, uh, except making people do what they didn't really want to do. Uh, behavior, uh, Watson uh, theorized that children could be conditioned into, into anything you wanted, but Skinner actually proved that he was right. Uh, Skinner developed the Skinner box for use with animal subjects that was eventually expanded into a human version. The human version of a Skinner box is uh, the form of a crib. Uh, never, as they, the Skinner box for humans never actually caught on. Uh, but this is his daughter, uh, Skinner's daughter, who and this is uh, a roll of paper uh, that she messes up. You know, she messes up in her crib, and you can just roll it out and get rid of it. You don't have to wash things. Anyway, it doesn't really look like much of a bed, does it? The reality is that uh, this and this are the same. Uh, by playing with this and, and uh, playing with it a number of times, she would be rewarded, and so she would uh, 
continue to do what uh, what Skinner wanted her to do. The rat, on the other hand, um, uh, he gets food pellets for pushing on the lever, so he's he, tr he has trained him to uh, uh, to push the lever. Skinner's use of rewards and punishment re were referred to as operant conditioning. And uh, there you go. E.F. Skinner. Behaviorism. Uh, Skinner felt that by reinforcing or rewarding a behavior, a controller could increase the likelihood of the behavior occurring again. On the other hand, by punishing a behavior, the controller uh, would make it less likely to occur again. And of course, the more you praise your child, the more likely that they will do uh, what you want, what you're praising them about. The more you punish them, the less likely they will do uh, what you're punishing them for. Um, social learning theory, uh, Albert Bandura is the author of uh, social learning theory. Uh, Bandura felt that people learn and copy people who are around them through imitation, which he referred to as observational learning. Bandura feels that people construct themselves through re rewards, punishment, and imitation, and then view the outcome as self-efficacy. And uh, that is part of his social learning theory. We'll talk more about his social learning theory later. Uh, the cognitive development uh, theory was developed by Jean Piaget. Uh, he is, uh, Switzerland is divided into uh, four sections. Uh, uh, part of it is closer to France, where they speak French. And part of it is closer to Germany, where they speak German. And part of it is closer to Italy, where they speak Italian. And then there is a, there's actually a Swiss language, Helvetian is what it's called, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a Swiss language. But most people in Switzerland speak all three languages. Jean Piaget uh, was from the French section, the, that's closer to the, to the Alps, uh, to the, the French Alps, and uh, he spoke French, so he did all of his writing in French. Uh, he... Uh, he was working at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, mostly with his own children. He had six children, I think five or six children, uh, and he he watched them as they as they developed, and then he uh, he took his theories from his own children and moved them into to a school setting uh, to see if he was correct. Uh, Piaget based his theory on the cognitive de development of uh, of the child, and he watched them as they gained knowledge and uh, did new things. Uh, so his cognitive development mental theory is actually the uh, theory that they're using in education now. Uh, when I first started in psychology, uh, how long ago was that? <laughs> when I first started in psychology almost 50 years ago, um, Erickson was, uh, they were using Erickson's developmental theory. Uh, in schools. And then uh, this was in the 1970s. Uh, in the 1970s, we weren't really happy with, very happy with the French. So there weren't a lot of French uh, textbooks that were being uh, translated, as weird as that sounds. So uh, in the 90s, uh, we started uh, following Piaget. Uh, we, somebody translated Piaget, and everybody thought it was, it was a lot better to, to, to look at a child as uh, by his, the, um, his, the development of his brain than by his social development. Uh, so education adhere, started adhering uh, to the cognitive developmental theory. So that's what's being used today, the, the Jean Piaget and his cognitive developmental theory. Piaget's first stage is the sensory motor stage and begins at birth and runs through age two. Uh, in this stage, the infant and toddler's knowledge is based on their senses and motor skills. Uh, their senses, this is one of the reasons why they put so much stuff in their mouth, uh, because they, uh, they can feel it, they can taste it. Uh, that's two senses that they're using right there. Uh, so they put a lot of things in there. I mean, you can touch it, uh, but that's one sense. But if you put it in your mouth, that's at least two senses, maybe three if you're smelling it at the same time. Uh, so it's the sensory motor stage is, uh, is the first stage, is his first stage. 
Uh, Piaget's second stage runs from toddlerhood until the beginning of, el of elementary school and involves a child's first attempts at reading and using numbers. This stage he referred to as the preoperational thought stage. Uh, if you notice, uh, Piaget, Freud, and Erickson, all, all their stages run at the same time. And we're going to talk about that in, a, in just a minute. The fact that change happens, whether it's, it's sexual change or social change or cognitive change, they all happen about the same time in all children. The third stage runs from the uh, first grade through uh, junior high school and involves the continued maturation of applying experiences to the logical operations of their knowledge base and is referred to as concrete operational stage. And that's one of the reasons why as you go through first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, I think sixth grade is still elementary school. Uh, the math gets more complex, the, the English gets more complex, the reading gets more complex, and the reason they're doing this is because they're building a base. And this is, this is what the concrete operational uh, uh, thought stage is all about. The fourth, uh, the last stage is the formal operational thought stage. It begins in early adolescence and runs through the rest of an individual's life. Uh, this stage involves the ability to think abstractly and to deal with hypothetical uh, situations. And of course, that's what video games are all about. This is all hypothetical uh, stuff uh, that needs to, uh, that, that people need to understand. I don't know why I put Harry Potter, a picture of Harry Potter in here, but there you go. That's from the movie, Harry Potter. <laughs> Um, okay, <laughs> so we didn't like the French very much because in 1969 they kicked us out of France. Uh, right after World War II, all the Allies, of course, got along, the French, the British, uh, the, uh, the United States, and we were, we were all working together, and then the French kicked us out in 1969. Uh, so we had to go to Belgium, and, and you know, we had to move out of France. The French wouldn't allow the American military in, 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 uh, in France anymore. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why uh, Piaget wasn't read. He wasn't read because um, we weren't reading French at that time. We were mad at them. Well, right after World War II, of course, there were four allies in World War II, the French, the British, the Americans, and uh, the Russians. We were all on the same side fighting the Germans. But after World War II, uh, the Russians kind of broke off and into their own sphere. They took over Eastern Europe, and of course, they were there, and the communists took over China, even though it wasn't the Russians. Uh, so the Cold War started, and the Cold War went on until the wall came down in Berlin in 1989, and the, the communist world started collapsing. Okay, so why am I talking about politics? Why am I talking about uh, U.S. history? The reason I'm talking about this is because there was a um, a man with a really good idea, and this guy was named this guy was Lev Vygotsky. He was he was Russian. Uh, he started off in uh, in Russia uh, before it became communist, uh, but of course, uh, he, as he was working on his his uh, his theories. Uh, the Soviets took over, and so he became, he, he was still a Russian psychologist, of course, uh, but, and, and he wrote uh, all of his theories down, and they were really good theories, uh, but of course we didn't read them because they were communist theories. They had come out of Russia, and uh, in the uh, uh, 1930s, before World War II, uh, we, we thought of them as Bolsheviks. We, we thought of them as, as tainted because they had this idea that, uh, that uh, uh, you shouldn't be, uh, you couldn't accumulate wealth. And we didn't like that because that was what the United States is capitalistic and they were not. They were communistic. Okay, so, <clears throat> um, so we, we didn't read Lev Vygotsky's theories until after the wall came down. This is in 1989. Now we 
we include uh, Lev Vygotsky in, uh, in the developmental theories because it makes a lot of sense. Uh, so I'll talk, we'll talk about Lev Vygotsky now. And the reason that it took us so long to, uh, to uh, allow Lev Vygotsky into our developmental theories is because he was the enemy. And just like the French were, we weren't really happy with the French. Uh, we weren't real happy. Of course, we haven't been happy with the Russians ever since the end of World War II. Uh, Vygotsky's sociocultural theory, his, his theory is not only social, it also uh, takes in uh, people's culture. Uh, and so how and why in the world would uh, you come up with this in Russia? Well, if you look at Russia, Russia is made up of a lot of different provinces, and each of those provinces had their own culture. And so what Vygotsky saw was in, in southern Russia, you learn things one way, and in northern Russia, where it's really cold, southern Russia is, is relatively warm, but in northern Russia, where it's almost it's, uh, close to the Arctic Circle, where it's really cold, the culture is completely different, and you learn things in a different way. Um, so he saw this, uh, looking at the educational pattern, uh, in, in Russia, he saw that beliefs, customs, and skills of the culture being passed from adult to the young were, were part of the educational process. This was included in the formal educational process. So if you, were, you lived in northern Russia and moved to southern Russia, of course, and, and you went to school, you were a 13-year-old and you went to school, your educational process would be completely different because the material would be uh, presented to you in a different way. Maybe it would be more authoritarian. Uh, maybe it would be more abstract. Uh, it's like the difference between the Diné culture and the, uh, the dominant Western culture. Um, the educational systems aren't, aren't the same. And that's one of the things that, uh, that Dr. Begay is working on. Uh, she's trying to come up with a, um, with a educational structure uh, to uh, for for her master's in in psychology in Navajo psychology uh, because she she feels that uh, uh, Diné culture teaches you to learn things differently and so that's why she's coming up uh, sh she's working on that uh, Yuri Bronfenbrenner uh, developed the uh, ecological theory of development uh, this theory sees the uh, uh, sees the child as the center of an ever-expanding system of influence that helps to create the person that the child will become. Yuri Bronfenbrenner sounds like he's European, but he's not. He was born in New York City. Uh, so his ecological system, uh, ecological theory of development, is, uh, is American. Uh, but he sees it as uh, the child, then the child's family, and then the school, and then the uh, extended family, the uh, uh, mass media, all the information that's coming in. He sees these as uh, different systems that work and give the, the child information. In the center of the concentric circle is the microsystem. The microsystem is composed of the child and their parents. Uh, the next ring of influence in the concentric circle is the mesosystem, meso meaning middle, uh, this ring is closest to the child because the child has direct contact with it. It's uh, their school, their friends, their extended family. That is the mesosystem. Uh, the next ring of influences in the concentric circle is the exosystem. Exo meaning outer, of course. This ring influences the child but may not make uh, contact with the child. Such things as parents' place of employment, the government and their social policies, and the parent's social network may or may not make contact with the child, but they still influence the child. The outer ring of the system is the macro system, macro meaning large. Uh, this uh, circle influences the child, but is mostly abstract influences has mostly abstract influences on the individual. Such things as historical events, culture, and ethnic group influence. Uh, the child, but it's not something that the child has any influence on. So it's not like uh, if you were uh, a Northern Plains uh, uh, indigenous person uh, that you could change the way that you danced or you could change the way 
that you uh, wore your traditional regalia. That's just not going to happen. Traditional is traditional, and there's just nothing you can do about it. Uh, this is a picture of my brother in Afghanistan, and obviously it's in August uh, of 2005. Uh, this is his Afghan driver, and that's him. I'm not sure. They stopped. He was uh, convoying uh, supplies to a to a, a fire base, and uh, you can see he's all dressed up. <laughs> and he's tall. Look how tall he is. Uh, he's actually taller than I am. I'm only five foot six, but he's he's about five ten, I think. And as you can see, the Afghan's pretty short too. Uh, so there's a lot of things that you can't change. Uh, you can't change your culture. You can't change historical events. Uh, the fact that my brother was in the military in uh, 2005, uh, there's nothing he can do. He, you can't change the fact that he went to Afghanistan and fought in that, uh, that portion of the war. Humanistic theories were developed from the work of Carl Rogers. This is Carl Rogers right here as a young man. Rogers saw the individual as a dynamic force that has the power to seek their own self-fulfillment by setting goals, meeting inner needs, and expressing creative energies. One of the things about the theories up to this point, we can go all the way back to Freud. One of the things about these theories is that uh, they were being con people are being controlled by something else. Uh, as far as Freud was concerned, they were being uh, uh, controlled by their by their s sexual structure, by who they were sexually. Erickson thought that society controlled them. Um, where, where are we? Uh, B. F. Skinner and John B. Watson thought that society should control people's behavior. Uh, uh, Alfred Albert Bandura uh, and his uh, social learning theory, uh, he felt that uh, people were being controlled by society once again, uh, by what they saw, by the punishment and rewards that they received. Um, Piaget felt that he that we needed to uh, that society, uh, help the child develop cognitively, and when they were ready for information, they were able to get it. And of course, Vygotsky culture and, and society uh, were controlling the individual. Yuri Bronfenbrenner, everybody that comes in contact with the child, even people that don't come in contact with the child, still uh, influence the child. And then we have the humanistic theories. The humanistic theories were came along because uh, because <clears throat> because Carl Rogers and uh, the people that came after him, including me, I, I'm a, I'm a humanist, uh, felt that uh, p people were being controlled too much uh, by culture, by society, by by different things, uh, and they needed to. Uh, they needed a, a way of reestablishing who they were, and that's what the uh, the uh, humanistic theories are all about. Humanism was developed uh, to combat the Freudian concept of unconscious drives controlling our behavior. Where do we get our unconscious drives? We get our unconscious drives by what has happened to us as children, by what has uh, happened uh, to the uh, to the individuals, as far as society is concerned, how they interact with their parents, how they interact with their peers, you know, all of this uh, forms an unconscious structure, and this is what controls our behavior. That's according to Freud. But the humanists felt that we needed to be our own selves, that we needed to reject uh, all, all the pressures put on us by society, by culture, by whatever. It, he, it also argues that the environment does not dictate who the individual is going to be. And that was huge. Besides Rogers, one of the leading humanists was Abraham Maslow. Maslow recognized that people were motivated to seek their full potential, which is, is labeled self act, which he labeled self actualization. Maslow arranged people's needs in a hierarchy that is normally arranged in a, in a pyramidal structure. 
Let me see if I'm going to go through this. Uh, let's go through this real quick. Uh, the first uh, needs were the ph physiological needs. And, and this is really kind of interesting because m most people don't argue with this. Uh, if somebody's starving to death, you know, self-esteem is not really important. What you need to do is feed this person. You need to make sure they have uh, water, food, uh, shelter, sleep, and uh, potentially, of course, uh, fulfill their sexual needs. Uh, this is used in, so, uh, in uh, social work, uh, uses uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, and psychology certainly does. Uh, anybody working with, actually working with people, understand that, uh, that Maslow's hierarchy of needs is basic. You need to take care of the physiological needs first. You need to make sure they're safe and secure. Uh, once you feed them and uh, fulfill their physiological needs, then you need to make sure they're safe and secure. Uh, then, then comes the, the, all the feeling things. Uh, once we have them in a secure situation, then love and belonging becomes important, self-esteem, and then, of course, self-actualization is the last thing we need to worry about. But we need uh, to fulfill all the other needs before we can get to self-actualization. It was Maslow's idea that before people could achieve a higher level on the pyramid of needs, they had to take care of all the lower needs first. Unless one's physiological needs are taken care of, safety, uh, safety is inconsequential. Uh, it is easy to observe Maslow's need structure in the plight of the refugees flooding into a Europe from Africa and the Middle East. Of course, this flood has, uh, has quieted down. Of course, the, the people coming into the United States uh, or trying to immigrate into the United States are still a problem. Physiological needs are the most important. Uh, safety needs are not necessary until survival needs are taken care of. The personal needs are secondary to basic survival. Researchers who have worked with Maslow's hier hierarchy of needs see people changing their needs as they grow older. Infants and toddlers need their physiological needs taken care of. As children get older, their safety needs are met. Adolescents are stuck in a time seeking self-esteem and belongingness. Only adults have fulfilled their lower needs and can seek self-actualization. One last theory is that of John Bowlby, uh, as proven by Mary Ainsworth. Uh, Bowlby developed a theory that used an infant's attachment pattern to its parents as the basis for, for future human interaction. Ainsworth developed a test to determine the type of attachment the child displayed with their parents and came up with four major types of attachment. Uh, the most uh, abundant of all the attachment uh, types is secure. Um, let, uh, from her research, we discovered that about 65% of all children have secure attachment to their parents. Um, but unfortunately, that's not we're not done. There's still 35% uh, of people. Uh, there are, and, and it, you probably have seen this in, in parents and children. Uh, some children d don't feel insecure around their parents. They try to avoid their parents. Um, some, you know, some degree of, of uh, children are like this. Um, some children don't want to have anything to do with their parents. They seem confused all the time disorganized and disoriented. That's a, another percentage of that 35%. And then the last is preoccupied and insecure. The child doesn't feel, uh, feels like they, they need to watch the parent. Uh, so who, who, would, uh, who would represent uh, these types of, uh, of security with their parents? Well, the preoccupied and insecure, um, um, people that, uh, when the parents are alcoholic, uh, have uh, drug uh, problems, then a lot of times the child has to be r real sensitive to what's going on in the in the family. Is, is dad drunk? Uh, is mom uh, uh, high on meth? Uh, if she is, she's not going to fix supper to, tonight. Uh, these children are very observant or overly observant, and that's because they're preoccupied with uh, survival and they feel insecure. Uh, same, the disorganized and disoriented uh, uh, child, uh, maybe the, the parent has a mental illness uh, where they don't always pay attention to them. Uh, so the child is, uh, 
doesn't know if, if the parent's going to interact with them or not interact with them. Uh, since they're not getting a constant uh, message of, uh, of, uh, uh, of love or uh, desire to, to, to help the child, uh, they kind of ignore the, uh, the parent. <clears throat> the avoidant, of course, is a child that uh, is focused on themselves. Uh, they're, they're not narcissistic, certainly, but uh, they uh, avoid uh, interacting with the parent. And as I said, about 65% of all children have secure attachment to their parents. Uh, the other 35% are, are, are these types. And a lot of times it's difficult to tell if they're avoidant, disorganized, or preoccupied. But uh, there are those children out there. And, and probably if you, uh, you went to school, you probably saw some of your classmates who fit the avoidant, disorganized, or preoccupied um, attachment uh, group. Lifespan is uh, multidirectional. The lifespan not only involves growth, but decline as well. Aspects of life may continue to expand, like your vocabulary, while others slowly decline over time, like your reaction, your reaction time. As you get old, uh, your reaction time decreases. This is one of the reasons why 80-year-olds very often can't drive cars, because they, their reaction time is uh, it's not very good. Uh, humans have the ability to adapt to different circumstances. This is known as plasticity. Uh, our fates as humans are not cast in stone. Uh, we have the ability to optimize our time or to truncate it. And of course, one way is that there are many ways to do this. Uh, you can uh, do dangerous things and potentially uh, terminate your life. Uh, there was a Olympian, an Olympic runner that just died in, a, in an automobile accident, uh, 29 years old. Uh, another way is to smoke. This is what somebody looks like when they smoke. Uh, their face gets, uh, their, fa their skin dries and uh, wrinkles uh, as they age. The person who doesn't smoke, of course, doesn't have the same problem. They won't age as fast. You can do things. You can drink alcohol, which is, is, is a toxin. Uh, you can smoke cigarettes or tobacco, it, which is another toxin. And, of course, they make you feel different at this time. But if you do this over a long period of time, of course, you're cutting years off your life. Drugs, of course, are the same. Uh, the sooner you have to take uh, any medication, of course, the uh, less likely that uh, you will live uh, an extended length of time. But then again, how long is an extended length of time? Do we all want to be 104 uh, when we die? We probably start off that way, but most of us aren't going to make it that far. Historical context, uh, we all live in, time, in uh, time, and each area in time is marked by the history of that time. Uh, while your parents lived post-Vietnam and 25 cent gallons of gas, you are living through 9-11, Iraq, and Afghanistan, and $4 uh, gallons of gas. Um, historical context, this is, uh, these are army men from World War II. This is my brother in Afghanistan in 2005. This is 19, the 19, early 1940s, 41 through 40, 45. This is uh, Afghanistan, and of course we just pulled out of Afghanistan. The Iraq and Afghan, Afghan wars are, uh, have been uh, terminated uh, last year, the year before. Uh, so, but they are historical. Uh, that's the historical context. So if you're in the military from 9-11, uh, which was in 2001 until uh, 2019, 2020, I guess, that's when we pulled out of Afghanistan, uh, potentially you were uh, deployed to either Afghanistan or Iraq. And if you served in the military from 1941 to 1945, you were deployed to either the European theater or the Pacific theater. And who knows how much gas is 
uh, I got gas yesterday, and uh, it cost me three dollars and nine cents a gallon. So uh, we're not quite at four gallons of four dollars a gallon at this point. Uh, multiple causation. There are many, uh, any number of things that allow us to turn out the way that we do. There are biological forces, physiological forces, sociocultural forces, and life cycle forces. These two individuals led, led parallel lives. Uh, each of them uh, grew up in a household uh, that wasn't quite intact. Um, this individual uh, was from the South and uh, his family moved to uh, New York. Uh, so he grew up with uh, where people didn't like him very much because he had a Southern accent around people from New York. This individual, is, uh, he was a, uh, considered a nerd uh, by the people that he lived with, by, by his schoolmates. He was rejected by his schoolmates because he was so different from everybody else. Uh, this individual, um, uh, was was rejected by his parents, and so was this individual. His both of his parents were workaholics, uh, so he had to find his own uh, entertainment. And so did this individual. This one became a juvenile delinquent, and this one became a computer nerd. Um, eventually, of course, they even though their life trajectories uh, were fairly identical. Uh, one of the things that happened to this guy is that he assassinated, uh, that's, uh, uh, I can't think of his name. <laughs> this is the guy that assassinated JFK, and this, of course, is Bill Gates, became one of the richest men in the world. Uh, they were both arrested as juveniles. Uh, this is him in 1977, uh, arrested in Albuquerque, New Mexico for, for driving with an experience. Exper Expired uh, uh, driver's license. This is Lee Harvey Oswald. Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested as an adolescent for uh, juvenile delinquency, and of course, one uh, one became an assassin, and the other became the richest man in the world. Uh, developmental psychologists are interested in uh, how individuals change over time. Uh, for this reason, it is important that you. They select research designs that will inform them about the change that people go through. And I can't, this is Priscilla Presley. Uh, she's the person that married, and that's Stuart. I can't think of her first name. Anyway, she's, uh, she married Elvis Presley, and this is what she looks like uh, as she has aged. And this is Kristen, Kristen Stuart. Uh, I don't remember. Anyway, this is her as a child. And this is her as an adult. Uh, she has declared, oh, she she's married to a, a woman. Uh, of course, this lady was married to Elvis Presley. Couldn't have been a whole lot of fun. Anyway, uh, so now we're going to talk about research. Uh, this is how what people look like as they age. This is what Madonna looked like when she was younger. And this is what she looks like now. Uh, this is Bruce Willis. This is what he looked like. That's his high school yearbook picture. That's him now. Of course, he doesn't have very much hair. George Bush in 2000, uh, when he started his presidency. This is George Bush in 2007 at the end of his presidency. As you can see, he's aged a great deal. This is Arnold Schwarzenegger when he was Mr. Olympia. This is what he looks like now. He doesn't lift weights anymore. He doesn't quite have the musculature he had back then. Uh, but uh, he's not ripped. Um, okay. Uh, systematic uh, observation. Uh, systematic observation involves observing people or other animals and recording every... We're going to talk about developmental research. Uh, systematic observation involves ob observing people or other animals and recording everything of interest that they do. Uh, there's uh, two types of, uh, of uh, systematic observation. Naturalistic observation is the observation of people or other creatures as they spontaneously behave in their real life situation. Uh, structured observation is the observation of people or other creatures in an artificial setting to elicit a behavior. Uh, structured observation would be in, in a 
research laboratory um, or a laboratory situation. Naturalistic observation would be if you want to know how uh, people react in, uh, in uh, gas stations, you would have to go to a gas station and kind of sit there and watch people. That, that would be naturalistic observation. Um, maybe you want to see how people uh, react to um, uh, a stop sign, uh, a stoplight that, that won't change. Uh, so you'd sit there at the stoplight and watch people and see what they're doing while they're stopped at the stoplight. And then they get impatient, of course, uh, see what, uh, how much impatience you can see. That, that would be naturalistic observation. And uh, this is Jane Goodall working with her chimpanzees. This is Bandura's experiment. Uh, he put uh, three and four year olds in a room and had them observe adults playing roughly with toys and then playing nicely with toys. And what they found out was that the three, three and four year olds, when they were allowed to play with the toys, they played with the toys just like the adults that they saw. The ones that played nicely with the toys played nicely. And the ones that played uh, violently with the toys were violent. And this is a little girl hitting poor old um, Bozo with a hammer, with a wooden mallet. And that's what this, this lady is doing as well. So this would be uh, structured uh, observation, and this would be naturalistic observation. <clears throat> Experimental studies and experiment is a systematic uh, way of observing behavior where variables are manipulated so that an experimental variable can be observed. The manipulated variables are called independent variables and the measured variable is referred to as the independent variable. Okay, so when I was doing my research for my dissertation, I was observing, uh, I was observing indigenous people on the Northern Plains. And uh, my uh, dependent variable was resilience. I was trying to show that uh, the indigenous people of the Northern Plains were, were resilient. And uh, the independent variables I was looking at, I was looking at the level of trauma that they had had, the educational level that they had, uh, the age of the individual, uh, the gender of the individual, and there's one more, culture of the individual. How, how well did they adhere to their culture? Those were the five independent variables that I was looking at, uh, and uh, the de dependent variable was resilience. Did any of these things impact the, uh, the resilience of the individual? And as we go through this, I will explain how things turned out. Another method of accumulating data, uh, I'll tell you how things turned out right now. Um, okay, so the five independent variables, uh, what I discovered was that uh, uh, most of the people that I dealt with um, scored high on a resilience scale. Okay, so, so what was it that, uh, that uh, changed their resilience? Uh, there, was, there were two things that changed their resilience. Uh, age wasn't one of them. Whether they were old or whether they were young, they were still resilient. Uh, education. Sadly, as far as I was concerned, being an academic, education had nothing to do with resilience. Uh, the other was gender. Males and females were equally resilient. Uh, so, so gender, education, and age had nothing to do with, with resilience. The two things that uh, were, had to do with resilience, one was trauma. Uh, now, normally, if the more trauma somebody goes through, uh, the less resilient they are. But what I discovered was, with the population I was working with, uh, was that uh, the amount of trauma had nothing to do with resilience. Uh, they could have been uh, lived through a traumatic life, but they still were resilient. The one thing that affected their resilience was culture. The more they adhered to their culture, the stronger their resilience was. That's what I discovered in my research. Another method of accumulating data is to have people answer questions or record their thoughts. This can be done with surveys or with diaries. Uh, they were trying to discover why uh, women uh, who go to bars are more likely uh, to be assaulted. Uh, they couldn't figure out uh, what is it that about women uh, in bars. 
And what they discovered was that the more the more uh, women drank and the more uh, drunk they became, the more likely that they would be assaulted. That's what they discovered uh, as far as alcohol is concerned. Uh, so evidently men don't like drunk women. They act strange. I don't know. Anyway, so you can either use surveys or diaries uh, to accumulate this information. Uh, this was uh, discovered through through diaries. Uh, the, uh, the the fact that uh, the level of an inebriation had to do with uh, had to do with uh, more assault on the individuals. Physiological measures are measurements of physiological activity using various forms of instrumentation, such as EEG. EEG stands for electroencephalogram. Uh, PET scans, uh, positron emission uh, tomography scan, or functional MRI. MRI stands for magnetic resonance imaging. And these are one of these. This is the PET. This is the PET scan, and that's a functional MRI, I think. Okay, they're they're quite similar actually. Once a researcher selects the method of testing, they must show that it is reliable and valid to be used on this population. Reliability refers to the test's ability to measure at the same level on a consistent basis. Is the test reliable? Does it always give you an accurate answer? Validity refers to the measurement actually measuring what they are supposed to measure. Uh, so if you're measuring uh, the ability to fly an airplane, um, what kind of a measure would you use? Well, using a pen and pencil test uh, to, to tell if somebody could uh, fly an airplane that would that be valid or not? Well, somebody does really well on the test but can't fly an airplane, it's not very valid, I would say. And just because somebody doesn't do well on the a pen and pencil test doesn't mean that they can't fly an airplane. So that has to do with validity. Uh, the pen and pencil test is not valid for determining if somebody can fly an airplane. Research is generally done on a large number of participants to increase the acceptance of the results as generalizable to a larger population. And this is what I was doing. Uh, I measured, um, I was measuring uh, indigenous people of the Northern Plains, um, and I was, so I, I measured as many people as, as I could uh, find who would take my, my survey. The population is the total number of people who qualify for the research. The sample is the number of people who are actually in the research from the population. So I had a population of about 2,500 and I surveyed 107. So my sample was 107 and my population was 20, 2,500, about 2,700. Correlational study. In the correlational study, a researcher investigates the relationship between variables. Uh, the re results of a correlational study are normally measured by uh, calculating a correlational coefficient or plotting the relationship along an axis that runs from plus zero to minus one plus 1.00 to minus 1.00. So there's uh, a possibility of two. You're you're looking at two no, uh, at uh, a factor of two. So if somebody is has a positive uh, fifty point five six, uh, they're farther to to the left uh, on the positive side of of this of the study. If they have a minus fifty uh, point five six. It's uh, it's about one quarter of the way uh, on the negative side. Uh, of the, uh, and that's a correlational coefficient. Longitudinal studies uh, involve observing and or testing the same individuals or groups at various times over their lifetimes. An example of a longitudinal study would be the Kauai Longitudinal Study by Werner and Smith. Uh, these two researchers began following at-risk babies born in Kauai in 1955. The research continues to this day, so we're really we're still watching these people. And about every five years, they will do a, a another survey, uh, determining where these people are. Of course, 1955. That's they are 70. No, 
1955, 45. They're 67 years old. Uh, so some of them have died, uh, but uh, they're still watching these people. Werner, of course, isn't doing it anymore. Actually, neither of these two people are doing it. Uh, it's out of the, um, California Davis is, uh, is where the study started and where, where it continues. Uh, but uh, they're, they're checking these people every, every five years or so. And what they discovered was resilience. They found out you know, why people were resilient, which people were resilient, and which people weren't resilient. And what they discovered was the people who stayed on Kauai, which is a very small island, relatively small island, um, they weren't nearly as resilient as the people that left the island because they had more options. People that left the island had more options. And the people that stayed on Kauai had fewer options. But longitudinal studies such as Werner and Smith do have their problems. Because the individual takes uh, the same test over time, the practice effect comes into play. It is terrible, uh, terribly expensive, and the researcher must be supported in their research. And of course, that's what was going on. Werner and Smith, actually, Werner was the uh, uh, was the ma major researcher, and Smith was a social worker uh, on Kauai, and uh, uh, Smith was the contact, and Werner was the individual that was mostly crunching the numbers. Um, every five years or so, they come out with a new book. Uh, I think Smith has died, but uh, Werner is still there. When I did my research in um, from 2011 to 2000. 2008 to, to 2012, um, I actually used Werner's uh, uh, trauma survey, uh, and I wrote her a letter, and she was gracious enough to, to allow me to use her trauma survey. But it, it, it is terribly expensive, because you have to maintain these people over, or not really maintain them, but what you're doing is you need to ma maintain contact with these individuals over an extended period of time. And it does get very expensive. And it takes, I mean, this one's been going on for six, 67 years, so that's a long time. Cross-sectional study is a little bit easier to do a cross-sectional study, and that's what I did. I did a cross-sectional study. So uh, I uh, surveyed uh, a lot of different people uh, in a lot of different age groups. And uh, by doing that, I was looking at how, at res resilience, uh, at a lot of different uh, age periods. That was my idea. So cross-sectional studies also measure people at different times of life, but instead of following the same people over time, in a cross-sectional study, people of different ages are measured at the same time. Cross-sectional studies tend to be affected by differences between age groups. This is referred to as the cohort effect, as people raised in the same era are likely to have similar ideas. And that is the end of our chapter. Uh, so your first quiz is up. Um, for those of you, I apologize uh, for the confusion in this class. Uh, I know that some of you thought this was going to be a Zoom class. Uh, if it was a Zoom class, you'd actually be seeing this lecture uh, with me. Uh, but of course, you, could, you would be able to ask questions would be the only difference. Uh, but if you do have any questions, please, uh, either email me or you can uh, come to my office hours and uh, we can we can talk that way if it's um, if it's a cogent question that uh, that I feel that everybody needs to understand then I will uh, I will type it up in a, in a uh, email to everyone okay uh, so I'll see you guys next week your first quiz is up uh, so you can take that first quiz uh, you can probably use the uh, lecture or the uh, PowerPoints uh, to, uh, to answer most of the, the questions on the quiz. Uh, it is a good textbook, but uh, uh, PowerPoint is fairly comprehensive.